Hi, everyone, and welcome to LangChain, how to build ChatGBT for your data. My name is Greg Lochnane, and I'm the founder of the Machine Learning Makerspace, a brand new online learning community focused on empowering data scientists and machine learning engineers to build generative AI and LLM applications that create real value. We appreciate you taking the time to join us for the event today. Please share in the chat where you're tuning in from. We're so happy to see you at our first kickoff event. During our event today, you'll learn not only how to build a ChatGPT-like interface on top of a single document using LangChain, but you'll also learn what it takes to build a multi-document question answering chatbot complete with agent memory and backup Google search. If that already makes you feel overwhelmed, don't be. We're gonna take it step by step, one piece at a time, build everything up just like Lego blocks, and we're going to take it really easy when we get to the super advanced part. If you hear anything during our event that prompts a question, please follow the Slido link in the description box on the YouTube page. We will do our best to answer the most upvoted questions during the Q&A portion of today's event. Without further ado, I'm so excited to welcome my good friend and colleague, Chris Alexiak, to the stage today, as we'll be working as a team to deliver this lesson. Chris, what's up, man? Hello, yes, how are you doing? Very excited, uh, you know, to, uh, to be here. Yes, yes, Chris is the founding machine learning engineer at Ox, an experienced online instructor, curriculum developer, and YouTube creator. He's always learning, building, shipping, and sharing his work like a legend. He embodies what we aim to build here at the Machine Learning Makerspace, and I couldn't be more excited to share the stage with him today. One quick note on the flow, I'll share concepts and Chris will do the demos. So with that, we're gonna get right into it. Welcome to today's event. Hey, Chris, what do you say we tell them a little bit about where we're headed with the data that we'll be chat GPTing today and share a sneak peek of the final product? Absolutely, Greg. Today, we are going to be heading down the rabbit hole. So we're going to be looking at some of the texts uh, produced by Lewis Carroll. So the Alice in Wonderland series, more specifically. Uh, so we're going to be using that as the documents that we're going to query across and chat with. And uh, with that, we, we have an agent that helps us do that using LangChain that we've named the Mad Hatter. And so we'll just ask it a sample query here, which is something like, how can you avoid potential pitfalls of falling down a rabbit hole? You can see that the system uses our agent as well as our supplemental chains in order to produce a response. And that eventually will uh, output a response to us. Unfortunately, there's no specific information available how to avoid pitfalls of falling down a rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland. Uh, we, we know that our main character does fall down the rabbit hole, so that makes sense. Many lessons to be learned and many things to ask the Mad Hatter from here. Um, Chris, thanks so much for demoing that. Let's see how we built this thing up piece by piece. So first off, when we're talking about LangChain, we're talking about chains. This is the fundamental abstraction innovation that we want to keep in mind at all times. And beyond that, we want to kind of build things up with core components of the LangChain framework. To do our single document question answering, we need a few pieces that are gonna be really common for really anything that we build. We're gonna need a model, we're gonna need a prompt template, we're gonna to need to use a chain, maybe multiple chains, and we're going to need to create an index. When we get into multi-document question answering, when we get into agents, when we get into doing things that are a little bit more complex, we're gonna add some additional layers, some additional pieces, but really fundamentally these same core pieces, these core components are going to remain just the same. So we're gonna spend most of today's event focused on those. First up, 
Langchain is all about combining LLMs with other sources of computation and knowledge to really create those complex applications. This is the purpose. This is what it's doing for the world today. This is what you, you should be thinking about having it do for you. So how can you leverage an LLM to create something even better with chains? A chain is nothing more than a sequence of calls to other components, including other chains. So it's a very generic abstraction, but it's also a very useful one. The single document question answering is going to essentially require three simple chains. And we'll see how these are built up in the following slides and demo. We're gonna use the core components that we talked about in the outline, models, prompts, chains, and indexes. And we're gonna take them one at a time. First off, we need a model. And the type of model that we're going to use is called a chat model. This chat style model is a little bit different than maybe just the way you've been interacting with LLMs in an input output text oriented way so far. Instead, the chat style, the IO schema that we're using is going to be an input of a list of messages, of chat messages, and the output is going to be a single chat message. Now, as we get into the chat model, we need to sort of differentiate between the types of messages that we're going to be using. The way that we do that is we define what are called roles. And we have the roles outlined here in yellow. We're seeing we have the system, the user, and the assistant roles. These are core, these are fundamental. This is directly from OpenAI, and this is how we leverage Langchain is thinking about these roles. So diving a little bit deeper into the roles, the system role is going to be that thing that provides a little bit of context, provides maybe a voice, maybe a user persona, maybe a character. We're sort of telling it a stance to take um, some place from which to answer the question. In this case, you are a helpful assistant is the system message. The user message is simply the user of the program. Could be you, could be anyone else using the application that you've built. And the assistant message is essentially the AI message. It allows us to act in place of the AI answering questions, effectively producing a one-shot example in a prompt input. Okay, so let's uh, go a little deeper on that idea um, after we just, just really note here that OpenAI and Langchain use very similar terminologies, but not exactly the same. So the system message is the system message, straightforward. User message in OpenAI is called human message in Langchain. And the assistant message is called the AI message in Langchain. Again, this allows us to provide outputs from the perspective of the AI that we are interacting with, essentially providing a few shot example. So let's check out how this works with uh, some Kraft Mac and Cheese. Chris. Yes. Okay. So we'll pop into the code here. Uh, and I mean, first things first, we just want to be able to interact with our LLM using Langchain. So we're going to, in order to begin doing that, we're first going to have to grab some dependencies. So we're going to start with OpenAI and Langchain. Uh, since again, like Greg said, we're going to be leveraging the OpenAI endpoint here. Uh, we just have to set up our OpenAI API key. So this is to ensure that we have access to the uh, open AI endpoint. We have this helper function. This is just to display the text in a way that's uh, nice to look at. Uh, there, it's not doing anything anything uh, fancy though. And down here is where we first set up our chat model. Now, the first thing to keep in mind is that because we are using a chat model, so this is GBT 3.5 Turbo, we do have to make sure that we're using chat open AI from Langchain's chat models. Uh, and this is all we have to do to set up that chat model is just you know instantiate it with the model name as GBT 3.5 Turbo. Now we can leverage what Greg was talking about, right? So when it comes to the language that is used between Langchain and OpenAI, we have the system message, user message, and assistant message that uh, Greg was talking to. In Langchain, that's the system, system message. And then the user message is instead referred to as the human message. 
and the assistant message is referred to as the AI message, but they're, they're the same thing. Uh, so you don't have to worry too much about that. Just a naming convention. You'll notice that in our system message, we can input some text. So we have content and it's, you are a food critic. We have some content in our human message or our user message, which is, do you think craft dinner constitutes fine dining? And then we have our assistant message or our AI message in Langchain with the content eGADS. No, it most certainly does not. So you can see that we've set up the system message, the user message, and the assistant message. We do this to guide how the LLM is going to respond when we give it a second user message, which is, what about Red Lobster? Surely that constitutes fine dining. We just need to combine these messages into a list. So we have our system message, our first user message, which was uh, this, do you think craft dinner constitutes fine dining? Our assistant message, which was the response that we're prompting it with. And then our second user message, which is meant to get a response from the uh, assistant, or in this case, the open AI endpoint. We call that chat model that we built above with this list of prompts, and we can get a response. Uh, ah, Red Lobster. Well, it may offer a casual dining experience with a seafood focus. I wouldn't classify it as fine dining. Fine dining typically involves a higher level of culinary press. I mean, it goes on. The idea here is that we're able to provide all of this context to our LLM in different and cool ways in order to guide how it's going to respond to us and how it behaves. Uh, so we'll go to Greg to learn about the next uh, concept that we'll be leveraging. Awesome. Very cool, Chris. Uh, so Red Lobster, casual, craft, not fine dining. Check. Single document QA prompts is what we need to do next. So we need to look a little bit closer at how we do prompting beyond the idea of this chat model. And let's sort of recall a couple of prompt engineering best practices. Uh, many of you have done a lot of prompt engineering so far. And the core thing that we need to always keep in mind is give specific instructions. Now, beyond that, we want to provide some context. That's always providing some sort of role or voice or character, a uh, place from which the AI can stand. Again, in this case, you are a helpful assistant. And then Additionally, we want to really specify the input when we're doing prompting, right? Zero shot gives us some decent results sometimes, but when we can give it an example or two, that kind of gives us better and better results. So that's where we see in this OpenAI example, we're giving it one example output in the assistant role here. Who won the World Series in 2020? the Los Angeles Dodgers won the World Series, so we can ask it a follow-up question. All right, so as we get into sort of a prompt template, this allows us to do all of this a little bit easier and allows us to kind of do things over and over without replicating, copy-pasting prompt stuff all the time over and over again. So it's really a straightforward tool that you're gonna have to use pretty much every time you go to try to build anything. In this case, we've got, you are an expert in subject and you're currently feeling mood and we can provide any sort of user prompt simply with this content here. So Chris, walk us through how this prompt template works and a quick example that we're gonna do on sparkling water. You bet. So. As Greg was discussing, one of the things that Langchain is best at, right, is reducing boilerplate. So it does this in a number of ways, uh, both through reducing boilerplate code, so code that you typically have to just write a lot of times, as well as reducing prompt boilerplate. So in this case, we're using prompt templates in order to build, you know, kind of pre-built prompts that we know are going to be effective for the task at hand and then modifying them on the fly with specific user uh, provided information. So you can think of it like we're building an F string almost in Python that we can uh, get it set up properly by including these additional pieces of context. So like we discussed, you are an expert in subject and you're currently feeling mood. So the things between these curly braces are gonna be replaced by user provided context. And the way we make that happen is by using this system message prompt template from templates. And then we provide this prompt template here. 
You'll notice as well that these do have roles. So this is the system message prompt template, and this is the human message prompt template. So you can have a prompt template for all of the different roles uh, that your LLM has. We're going to build the human message prompt template to just be content. So it's going to be the user's question or query, and that's all we're going to pass along to the uh, LLM. In order to make this work in one shot, we need to make sure that we create a chat prompt template from messages. These messages are these two templates we've already set up. So there's a system prompt template and a user prompt template. And this is familiar to what we saw above when we created this list, except this time we're able to format whatever we'd like in place of these variables. So let's see an example of doing that. We're going to use the format prompt method to format our subject to be sparkling waters, the mood to be joyful, and the content to be high. What are the finest sparkling waters? We're going to send this to messages just so we can send it directly to our uh, LLM chat model. Now, all we're doing here is saying the subject becomes sparkling water. So you are an expert in sparkling waters, and you're currently joyful. That's 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 what we're doing. We send that to our chat model, and we display it so it looks uh, decent in Markdown, and we get this response, right? So as an expert in sparkling waters, I can assure you there are plenty of wonderful options to choose from. Uh, we have Perrier, San Pellegrino, Topo Chico, Gerolsteiner, and LaCroix, and that's basically how we do it, right? We could substitute anything we wanted for that uh, subject or mood. And we don't have to rewrite the prompt. We don't have to do anything like that. Uh, Langchain handles that for us through the use of the prompt template. We'll pass it back to Greg uh, to explore the next concept we're going to be leveraging. Nice. Very cool, Chris. Great to see how that prompt template can help us make decisions about not just what to eat, but what to drink as well. Uh, let's see. As we get into actually chaining things together, this is no more complex than simply putting things together. So our LLM chain that we're gonna use is the most popular chain that you're gonna come across within Langchain. It's simply taking our chat model and taking our prompt template and linking those two things together with a code that really is as simple as what you just saw on screen. Chris, let's see how, how this works exactly. You bet. Uh, just as Greg said, this is very straightforward. We are just looking to chain our prompt into our LLM. So again, this is to reduce boilerplate, right? We sure we could just wrap this in a function and uh, you know call it whenever we needed it with the LLM with the chat model. So you know just just wrap this all. Instead, though, we can build a LLM chain which is going to have that prompt, have knowledge of that prompt, and chain it into our LLM as well as returning the response through our LLM. So in order to build this, all we have to do is provide our chat model, which we created in the first demonstration, and then our chat prompt, which we created just a moment ago, and put them into an LLM chain. Now we can call chain.run, which is going to run our chain, unsurprisingly. Uh, we can include our subject, our mood, and our content. So this time we're saying sparkling water, again, just to stay on theme, but the mood is angry. And we're asking it, is bubbly a good sparkling water? To which it responds, bubbly, are you kidding me? That stuff is a disgrace to the world of sparkling water. It's nothing more than cheap imitation trying to ride the coattails of true sparkling water brands. The flavors are weak. The carbonation is lackluster. And don't even get me started on the aftertaste. So watered down disappointment. So this is the idea. Right, we're, we're able to modify these things on the fly and we're reducing the amount of boilerplate that we have to write when we're creating these applications. And while it's very straightforward with this simple example, right, once it gets more complex, you're gonna need uh, to leverage these tools in order to effectively keep track of your prompts and how information is flowing through your application. Uh, so we'll pass it back to Greg to see an or to learn about the next concept we'll be leveraging. All right, so down the sparkling water rabbit hole, we found out that bubbly is disappointment in a can. So moving on, we've got indexing. And this is really where a lot of the magic happens outside of just tapping into the LLM when we're talking about building applications. 
So we need a couple of different components here, but this is where we get data centric. This is where the data comes in. And this is where we put it into a form that the LLM can interact easily with. We're gonna need things like document loaders, text splitters, text embedding models, vector stores, and retrievers. So let's try to break down some of this terminology before we look at the code to see if we can get sort of the big picture of exactly what we're doing. You know, when we're creating a question answering tool to look through documents, we essentially need to first create our index. And our index is our vector store. It is our vector database. In fact, a vector database is simply one type of index. It's the most common kind. So we're taking our documents, we're splitting them into chunks. Could be one document, could be many documents. We're creating a ton of embeddings, which is essentially turning those words, in the case of the documents we're looking at today, into numbers and into vectors. Then we're storing those vectors in the vector store. Simple enough. The retriever allows us to then search that vector store. It's an interface that allows us to query the vector store and really get a response of what is most similar to what it is that we're looking for that exists inside of our data. And that's the question answering chain is kind of the index and the retriever store. So let's double click in a little bit on index here. An index is a generic term, so don't be scared of it. It's simply a way to structure documents so that an LLM can interact. But really the index that you probably care about today is the vector database, AKA the vector store. This is just what, you know, we just kind of talked about where it's numbers, the vectors are being stored. And the Langchain default is to use Chroma DB. That's the one that we are gonna to use today. And we will share a link with you in the chat a little bit more on why Langchain chose Chroma DB as the default. Langchain supports a ton of other vector databases. And that's something that we're gonna get into in future events and in future community um, content. But for today, we're going to focus on Chroma DB, the simplest possible index, which is a vector store. And as we build up a single vector store, sort of the canonical vector store steps are we're going to load documents. We're going to split up the text. Now, splitting of the text is more of a black art than a science. So Chris will kind of walk us through that. We're going to create embeddings from the text. We're going to use kind of the industry standard today. The OpenAI ADA embeddings model is what we're going to use um, in our application. And then we're going to store the vectors. This vector store is kind of the backbone of the retriever, which simply wraps around the vector store and allows us to query in natural language something that we're looking for and it looks for something similar inside um, to take out. And it does this really, really fast. That's the benefit really of the vector store. And timely that it does it really, really fast. And not surprisingly, we're gonna ask it uh, about why the rabbit is running so late um, as Alice chases him down the rabbit hole. Chris, let's see how this works to uh, put all this together. Yes, okay, so first things first, we have to get our document in, right? So in order to query across documents, we have to have some documents. So we're just gonna go ahead and uh, wget1, uh, which is going to be the first Alice in Wonderland book by Lewis Carroll. She's just gonna name Alice underscore one dot text. Uh, essentially, first things first, every time is you have to get the data to Python, right? So we're going to go ahead and load this into memory using just classic Python here. Uh, nothing, nothing laying chain about this. And once we have it loaded, we can go ahead and start thinking about splitting it. Now, there's a number of ways we can split text. And we kind of need to split text in most cases anyway, because LLMs don't truly have infinite uh, context windows, right? So you can't shove everything into the context window of an LLM. So the character text splitter is going to help us break our 
data down into bite-sized chunks uh, that retain as much information as possible, but are otherwise just there to uh, ensure we can grab only the most relevant context and we don't need a bunch of other context. As well, if we include too much context, it could potentially confuse the LLM, and so we want to avoid that as well. We're just going to use the character text splitter here. We're going to go ahead and we're going to split on the new line character. And we're going to have a chunk overlap of zero, as well as a chunk size of a thousand. Now, what this means is that we're going to, every time there's a new line, we're going to potentially split if what's after the new line is too much for our context window. So you can imagine we're just splitting apart by new lines uh, until we have, uh, you know, the, the most information in this 1000 uh, character length window. All we have to do is call dot split text on Alice in Wonderland and it goes ahead and splits it. We get 152 resulting chunks. So this process is also called chunking. Once we've finished chunking, we can go ahead and create our OpenAI embeddings model. Now, this is as easy as just pulling it from Langchain. We have embeddings.openai, and then we get the OpenAI embeddings, which is going to use that ADA uh, embeddings model from uh, OpenAI's endpoint, as Greg was discussing. We have to get a few dependencies since we are going to be using Chroma DB. Uh, and as well, we're going to be using tick token in order to tokenize correctly and make sure we have the right number of tokens when we're actually running this through our uh, embedding process. In order to embed, though, all we have to do is call Chroma from our vector stores. We use dot from texts on it. We pass our text. That's our 143 chunks. We pass the embeddings model, and we just add some metadata. This metadata is just associating each passage with its number in the 143 long sequence. Uh, and then we, of course, have our retriever, which is the retriever wrapper as Greg uh, discussed so that we can query this in order to get relevant documents from our vector store. Again, we're storing everything as numbers. So any information that flows into this will be embedded and then uh, we'll, it'll be conv the relevant text will be extracted. So you're going to be able to interface with it through uh, text. We can see an example of this by asking it, what is the rabbit late for? We use the get relevant documents method on our retriever, and we just pass in our query. And we can see that it finds some context that's you know relating to the rabbit being late. It says, oh, the Duchess, the Duchess. Oh, won't she be savage if I've kept her waiting, right? So we know that the, uh, the Dutch is going to be mad if that rabbit is late. Um, finally, we're able to integrate this into a QA chain, which is, again, built using an LLM. And we're using this chain type of stuff, which just means we're going to stuff all of the relevant context we found into the prompt um, so that our LLM can leverage it as potential context. And then we're going to pass our query. We're going to run our input documents, which is our uh, docs extracted from get relevant documents. And that's going to be about it. We can call this chain using chain.run. And we know that the rabbit was late for something, but it's not specified what he's late for in the given context. So this is basically putting all the steps we discussed earlier together. We have our chain, we have our prompt, we have our retriever, and finally we get our response. So uh, we'll pass it back to uh, Greg to continue on with, uh, with learning. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And it's really interesting to see how we kind of have to be real specific. We, we have to sort of learn exactly which context to use, uh, how exactly to interact with the data, how we're chunking the data matters. Uh, each piece of how we build up the, this application really does affect the user experience. And so it's, it's really, really interesting to see all of this kind of come together. This is in an image what we just built, this single document QA. So we enter a query, we use our templated prompt, it looks for the answer within the vector store that we created with Chroma DB, that we took our documents and we chunked and converted to embeddings before we put in there. 
and the interactions with the LLM occur on the search and as well as uh, when we're doing our prompt. So this is sort of the simplest, one of the simplest, most common things that you can do, the single document QA. And this fundamentally is a natural language interface for your data, chat GPT for your data right here um, in an image. And so what we wanna to do today is we want to give you some insights into how to build a much more complex application, uh, but we're not gonna go through each piece of code. We're gonna share the code, but we're not gonna go through every single piece of it because of time constraints on the event today. However, if you do have questions, uh, please do share them in the Slido and we will get to them at the end, or you can wait till the end to ask them in Slido as well. Uh, we should be able to answer any and all questions that you have today. So with that, we're gonna take it to the next level here. And again, we're getting more advanced. We're gonna do a multi-document QA with Google search chatbot. All right, so we're gonna add, and we're gonna share the Colab notebook with you now, although we're not gonna go very deep into it. Chris is gonna produce a collab notebook run through post event that we will share. Okay, so this is a little bit more complicated, but again, we have the fundamental chains, the prompt chain, the tool chain, the data indexing chain. We just have a few extra pieces in each. So what are those extra pieces? Well, before we get to that, let's talk about agents for a second. This is one of the most confused concepts within LLMs and within generative AI right now. And I think one of the best ways to think about it is with a, a quote that I pulled from a book that I was reading recently called Complexity. Agents is sort of a generic term. Agents might be molecules or neurons or species or consumers or even corporations. Molecules form cells, neurons form brains, species form ecosystems, consumers and corporations form economies, and so on. At each level, new emergent structures form and engage in new emergent behaviors. Complexity, in other words, is a science of emergence. And what are we doing today? We're using LangChain to build complex LLM applications. Agents are a key way that we can take our complexity to the next level. Agents in LangChain are simply in a similar way to indexes, LangChain talks about these, they are used for applications that require a more flexible chain of calls to LLMs and other tools. Agents essentially have a tool belt. They have access to a suite of tools. You can think of Agent Smith from the matrix with a tool belt, although it's not a perfect analogy. Which one to use in the tool belt is based on the user's input and the output of one tool can be the input to another. There are two types of agents in LangChain. We're gonna focus on action agents to build our Mad Hatter agent chatbot today. Now, the action agent, simply receives input, decides which tool to use. In this case, we're either gonna leverage a search of our index or we're going to do a Google search. And it calls tools and records outputs. It decides the next step to take based on the history of the tools, the tool inputs and the observations. Now this history piece is what requires us to add a little bit more to our tool chain, specifically the memory buffer. We have to remember what we were doing so that we can select the next best step. In addition to the memory buffer, we're also adding Google search to the tool chain. And in addition to everything else, we're adding multiple types of documents. So this is different file types and multiple documents to our data indexing chain. But again, fundamentally, we're gonna use data indexing chain, a tool chain, and a prompt chain. And that's really the key components that we need to add. There is some additional complexity when we go to implement the code. Um, 
But what we want to show today is we want to show how this all comes together when we build not just in a Google Colab notebook, but when we actually create a chainlet application, a chatbot-like interface, a true chat GPT for your data interface on top of this multi-question answering agent system that can also do Google search. So Chris, can you walk us through a few examples? So maybe we can learn not just what the Cheshire cat, Cheshire, 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 Cheshire cat is up to, but maybe if we can interface a little bit with that agent to learn how it's working without digging too deep into the code for today's presentation. Yeah, what of course. Yes. yes. I mean, really quickly, I'm just going to go through a couple of the concepts that we're adding. So we added more data. It's basically the same process we did before, uh, but you add new data. Uh, we're persisting that uh, vector store. It's great. The first real thing we're going to leverage in order to get that chat GPT-like experience is we're going to add memory to our chain. Now, we'll, you know, we're not going to talk too much specifically about this, but the idea is that we can provide both a conversation buffer memory, which is like, you know, what's happened in the conversation so far memory, as well as read only shared memory, which is this idea that some tools can get access to the memory, but they can't actually change it, right? So conversation buffer memory can be modified. Uh, this read only shared memory cannot. So this is useful for tools that should be able to leverage memory, but shouldn't be able to commit anything to memory. In order to add that to our chain, all we have to do is include it. Memory equals read-only memory. You'll love to see it. We're going to set up a couple of tools. You can think of tools as these, an extension of chains that uh, you know can be leveraged by our agent that sits on top and gets to see the descriptions and choose which tool is right for which job. Uh, you know, in this case, we have our main QA system, which is our index-powered uh, uh, QA retrieval chain, and then we have a backup, which is Googling. Right, So uh, obviously this is not going to be every case. You're not going to just be able to Google, uh, but if you can, this is, this is an example of that. We create the actual agent. This is just showing you how you can go through this. We don't have to focus on much here, except that we have full control over how the agent acts, what it's supposed to do. We have the ability to give it this chat history so that it can make decisions based on its memory. We have the ability to ask it questions, which are input, and then we have the ability to let it quote unquote think. Um, you you can uh, leverage that thinking a little bit more complexly, but for right now, we're just going to let it do what it needs to. We create our zero-shot agent with our tools and then with our prompt templates, and then we provide it what the inputs should be. We create our chat model. This is going to be our LLM chain that kind of powers that agent. And then we set up our zero-shot agent with that LLM chain. This is the same LLM chain that we had before with our chat model and our prompt, our prompt being the agent prompt. And then we make an agent executor. Basically all this is, is it's making something that's allowed to call other tools, call other chains, uh, and then use those outputs to strategize or come up with a more uh, clear or concise answer. Once we have all of this set up, we're able to ask it the question, what is the deal with the Cheshire Cat? We can see that it enters the new chain, it has this thought. This is the agent executor. It has this thought, and it decides it needs to use the Alice in Wonderland QA system, which is our main retrieval QA system. We are going to ask that system, what is the deal with the Cheshire Cat? It returns a response, and our executor makes an observation, which is that Cheshire Cat is a character in Alice in Wonderland's, in Alice in Wonderland's known for its distinctive grid. It gives an answer. Then the thought of the agent is that it knows the final answer. And so it could just give us that when we see it here. The Cheshire Cat is a mischievous and enigmatic character in Alice, Alice's Adventures. It is known for its distinctive grin. I lost my scroll, but I'm so sorry. For its distinctive grin and ability to disappear and reappear at will. So then I asked the question, well, what makes it enigmatic? And this is where that Chad GPT experience comes in, right? We don't have to ask what makes the Cheshire Cat enigmatic, we ask what makes it enigmatic, and our agent knows, right? I'm not sure about the specific details that make the Cheshire Cat enigmatic, 
So it asks, again, the QA index, and it gets a response. And the response is, the Cheshire Cat is enigmatic because of its ability to disappear. It's riddles in its knowledge of Wonderland. So then I ask, well, what are some of those riddles? The Cheshire Cat, uh, you know, he has riddles, but we want to know them. We ask the context, and the context doesn't find it. This is likely because riddles isn't present. He probably doesn't say, I'm going to ask you a riddle now, Alice, where he just asks a riddle. So we have to go to our fallback tool, which is the Google search. We can see that the agent doesn't find any riddles in the QA retrieval train. And so it goes to the backup and it Googles what the riddle is. And we get the example of a riddle, which is what road do I take? Now, again, what is Alice's response to that riddle? We're not having to provide that context because of the memory. We're in an ongoing conversation here, right? So uh, in this case, because... It knows what that riddle is. It's what road do I take? We can actually see the agent executor decide to ask our QA retrieval chain, what is Alice's response to the Cheshire Cat's riddle? What road do I take? And because it's provided the riddle itself, we get the context and the context provides us the answer, which is, I don't care. I don't much care where, so long as I get somewhere, which is Alice's response to the Cheshire Cat's riddle. So with memory, with the agent executor, with the tools, we're able to have a seamless chat experience just as you expect from GPT 3.5 that includes our context that we've given this particular uh, agent through the QA retrieval chain. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Greg uh, to, to wrap us up. Boom, that was awesome, Chris. That was so cool to see how exactly the chat bot is working behind the scenes, what it's thinking, how it's making decisions. Um, really uh, just a lot to take in there as soon as we start playing around with agents. Um, really enjoyed you walking us through that. From today's event, you know, we really hope that we showed you that the potential for building truly complex applications is there, you know, really emergent applications. It's all there. It's just like, what are you going to build? Single document QA is really a fantastic entry point for anybody getting started with this tech. It is going to teach you about the foundational constructs within the Langchain framework, and it's going to allow you to get that chat GPT like experience with your data doing simple queries. Although if you want to take it to the next level, after you master those basics and you want to get that true chat bot, chat GPT experience, you really can't beat adding agents, adding additional ways of finding information and really just getting creative with what exactly the pieces are that you're chaining together. So, you know, thank you so much for, you know, Chris, for showing us that. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we've got the Google Colab links. We're going to share the slides, the Chainlit demo that you saw today as well in the beginning. We're going to share that. Um, reach out to us directly with any questions that we don't answer today. Greg at mlmaker.space or Chris at mlmaker.space. And with that, I'd like Chris, join me back on stage as we uh, go through the questions of the day. So if you have additional questions, please go ahead and add them to the Slido. We've only got a few going today. So if there are more questions, we've got time for them. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and break early. All right, so first off, love this. Thank you, Anonymous. However, I'm am I correct in assuming there's no way to, quote, ground these models without sending data to the OpenAI endpoint? I'm concerned about... PII, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, so you can, uh, luckily. Uh, open source models generally are performant enough now that you can use them to power this, uh, which means you can run them on-prem. You could also use your own proprietary models. You can also use Azure uh, services to provide you like a closed source open AI instance in which you don't have to uh, expose any PII. So there are many different ways that you can kind of control the PII flow um, that doesn't expose it to any public endpoints uh, or, or semi-closed endpoints. So you can ensure that your customer's information is uh, kept private and never leaves whatever you know contract, data contracts you have, it never leaves that scope. So um, you, 
you are unfortunately incorrect, but also fortunately incorrect, right? So uh, you don't have to use uh, OpenAI, uh, but for this example specifically, we are leveraging it. Yeah, we're hearing that more and more, aren't we? People trying to move away from OpenAI, but um, it's a great yeah. teaching tool. I feel like we find uh, it's a great entry point, play around with some open source data with it. Um, but yeah, if, if you're using your own data, certainly uh, might be worth looking at some other things. Um, Okay, so uh, from not a number, we have if raw tabular data with labels is presented as a as a text document, and QA is like quote predict new label for row, where row has new feature values, would this work? Sure, <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, why not? Uh, yeah, I mean you can make it work, right? So we can format the response from our LLM through Langchain using format or response formatting tools that are provided within the Langchain framework. Uh, so you can format it right back into the row if you want. Um, the, the There is a lot of research and papers that indicate that uh, the LLM can be used in such a way. So to predict like what the next thing is going to be. It's obviously not going to be without some serious modification or introducing new tools. It's not going to be like great necessarily. <laughs> But if you've built, say, a custom LLM that does this, right, and you hook it up to Langchain, it can absolutely be leveraged as a tool in that the agent could use, right? So you can put it into that flow. Uh, but I would say it depends on what performance you need or what you're using it for. But you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Right. It, like, almost like if you can dream it, you can do it with this stuff, right? I mean, it's generic as it, as it gets. Um, so the, uh, the next question is like the question that we keep getting like everywhere we go, Chris, like what open source models do you recommend for on-prem, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Uh, I don't, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately and fortunately the model zoo as it exists right now for lightweight LLMs or open source LLMs or however you want to define what you're meaning by open source here. Um, it, they're, they're all specialized in some way at this point or can be specialized. And so I think that when it comes to different tasks or different part of the agent chain, there's different responses to this. A more general, well-performing Instructune model is likely going to be your best bet for like the agent, right? Because that has to be a general, uh, it has to have general knowledge and ensure certain response response format. And then within each of the tools, you know, there's models that are better at that kind of open QA, right? Uh, or closed QA. I mean, it's it's totally dependent. I would say, though, if I have to give an answer, start with something like OpenLM's OpenLlama or Falcon 7B. These models are doing well enough to kind of fit wherever you want in the stack. You do have to keep in mind that it's going to error sometimes, right? So this is a, not a deterministic task. Sometimes it can give a response that doesn't make sense. And so you're going to have to build some custom error handling or parsing in order to kind of get over that hurdle that you might not have to if you use a much bigger model, right? So uh, Falcon 40B or an open AI endpoint. But the idea is if you need an answer to just get started, Falcon 7B or open, Llama, or open LM's Open Llama are a great place to start. Uh, as well as um, Shopify's new model is also fantastic if you were looking to uh, to use that. Mm, great insights. And, and I think the other layer of this is commercial availability versus no commercial availability. So definitely check the license on the models that you're looking at. If you're just playing around and learning, it doesn't really matter. But as you start to do things for your company, for your business, this is another key question that we're getting all the time. So that's a... That's definitely a deep dive for another day, but a definite emerging space there, which model for which application, which size, um, and uh, which commercial availability, how much privacy, all of these things are, are you know, really interesting open questions. All right, so from uh, Anonymous, can we ask this bot to summarize the information from our knowledge base in a particular way? Like, can we set the system persona, for example, as a product manager? Yes. 
Yeah. You sure can. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's a not an exciting answer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. do. I'm kind of thinking like, how would you train it to be more like your product managers? I don't know. You could kind of fall down the rabbit hole a little bit there, but yeah, you could certainly just kind of in that system message that we saw within the chat model, kind of just you are a product manager and start there. Also, I did miss misspeak. I'm very sorry. It, it, not Shopify, Salesforce, the new Salesforce. Model. Ah, yes. Sorry. Okay. My bad. Good call. Good call. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, tactical question. How do you control the size of the tokens sent to the model by Langchain? There's a max tokens parameter uh, that the OpenAI endpoint accepts. And so you can set it. Um, you can also limit it on your side using a number of language. So like that max tokens is for the response by the model. If you're wanting to limit what's sent to the model, you can also just uh, use lane chain to do that. There are parameters that you can set that help you to do that. You can build custom functions to help you organize or determine how much tokens you're willing to send. Uh, all of those things can be explored by uh, lane chain on either side of the LLM chain. Yeah, so as a follow-up to that, um, great presentation. How would you go about utilizing LangChain to create an application to generate docs that are three-plus pages long for commercial use? Yeah, I mean, you know, at that point, we have to kind of think about what our LLMs good at. Uh, we have to think about what's the best tool for the job. If you're wanting to do it all in one shot with very good context uh, adherence, you're looking at some of the larger context model, uh, context window models. This is something like Anthropics Cloud, MPT, uh, or even now OpenAI has like up to 16K tokens for ChatGPT 3.5 Turbo. So there's a number of considerations to make. Another way is to break it down into parts, only do one kind of you know part at a time. So paragraph by paragraph. I mean, there's a number of ways you can approach this, but ultimately what it comes down to is context window uh, and, you know, how much do you need persistent context through the entire three plus page long uh, document? Um, I would stick with your kind of clods and your big context window GPT fours if you really wanted that to to shine um, because they are the the best at those long contexts right now. Yeah. And finally, we have our last question from Deepak. Other than the Langchain website, is there any other website you recommend to learn Langchain? Also, in your experience, what is the best way to make retrievers? And yeah. I guess I'll just throw out the Deep Learning AI course that they recently put up with Harrison is a great place to start. Um, gives you uh, some, some insight, some overview. I'd recommend taking the prompt, the chat GPT prompt engineering for developers first to kind of get the vibe and feel. Uh, before you head into that, but you could have those two done by the end of the day today. They're just a couple hours each, maybe one to two hours. Um, any other thoughts on that, Chris? And then on retrievers? I got I to gotta do my catchphrase thing here, whatever. So uh, I would recommend just building with the tool to learn language change, just build stuff with it. Like you're going to find cool stuff in courses and like you're going to find cool stuff on websites. But if you don't have a reason that, you, that you're building or you don't have like a thing you're excited to build, you just, you just like they're not going to stick like they would if you're, you're trying to solve a problem. I would also say like, really don't worry about the fact that you're going to have over solved a lot of the problems. Like this is potentially overkill for a lot of tasks, uh, right? You could, you could do these with much simpler models and, and everything like that, but just use the tool to solve a problem. Um, you know, e even if it's over engineering, like it, it gets you used to the tool, gets you in it. And then the best way to make retrievers is there is some trial and error involved really understanding your data, understanding how to chunk it, understanding what potential context you could be losing uh, and, and you know setting those overlaps, setting the kind of chain you're going to use and the kind of retrieval you're going to use, right? So like we have normal cosine similarity, but maybe MMR is better because that takes into account what we've already retrieved. So we're, we're expanding our potential context space. There's a, a lot of little fiddly knobs you can use uh, but I would say the best way is to really understand your data and then uh, you know, leverage that information you have to set the correct parameters and, and use the correct chains. 
In other words, build, build, build. Okay, awesome, Chris. That brings us to the end of today's event. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. This has been brought to you today by the Machine Learning Makerspace. Our community is just getting started, and we're so grateful that you joined us for today's event. We're also excited to announce that our first ever four-week live course, which is going to be on LLM Ops, LLMs in production, is going to be offered starting August 14th. That's going to be the kickoff date. So in the follow-up email that you receive after today's event, We'll share not only a post-event survey, but all the details on our upcoming LLM Ops course. Chris is also going to put together a long-form video explanation of that multi-document QA chatbot with agent memory and Google search, and we'll be sure that you receive that as well. For everything else, please follow Machine Learning Makerspace on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and YouTube at ML Makerspace on Twitter, Machine Learning Makerspace on LinkedIn and YouTube to stay up to date on everything that comes next. Until then, we'll keep building, shipping, and sharing, and we hope to see you do the same. Till next time, everybody. Later.